Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This is the fourth dialogue in the Rejuvenate Dialogue series. Um, and we are really excited to have you all here today. Before I have some more formal introductions from our co-directors, uh, Vicki Johnson and Tessa Lewin, I'm just gonna go over some very simple housekeeping. Um, so uh, the show is about to start, but these are the just important little technical bits. Um, so first, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Zoom etiquette, if possible, it would be amazing if you can keep your camera on. It just gives us all a semblance of having lots of people in the room. Um, obviously, we know this isn't possible for everyone, but just to say we would like to see your faces if possible. Um, this is designed as a dialogue, and so we've not made it a webinar, which means everyone has the power to have their microphone on. Uh, it'd be great if your microphone could be muted during presentations, but we'd absolutely love to hear from you in the discussion uh, section. And if you don't feel comfortable speaking up, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yeah, use the chat box if you can. Um, we have turned on live captioning. This isn't perfect, but we're hoping that it will allow some people to read the captions if that's helpful for understanding. Um, discussion, like I said, please use the chat box, raise your real hand, raise your virtual hand, I'll look out for it. Um, and then just the last piece of housekeeping so you know is that uh, this is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please let me know immediately um, so I can make amendments. And that is all. And now I'm going to pass over to lovely co-director Vicky. Hi, thanks a lot. It's really fantastic to have all of you here. Um, so Rejuvenate, what is Rejuvenate? It's hosted at IDS, um, co-run in partnership with UHI, uh, the Centre for Living Sustainability. And um, it's really to provide a space for sharing a hub for communication to reconceptualize and rework and understand together children and youth rights. Um, why rejuvenate? I think a lot of this does actually lie in the politics of evidence. And really, even if some of us have made space and taken time and worked with children and young people or are young people doing research, who takes that evidence seriously? So I think this is what we're addressing today. In the world of adultism, unlike other isms, we were all children once. So even as adults, some of us actually unintentionally feel that we know what children and young people need and want, but context change, actually, times change. And uh, we still think it's really important to give space to children, young people across global contexts at different times in different ways. So um, this is the fourth uh, dialogue. And so the first three were on uh, our principles, which you can find on our website at rejuvenate.global. Um, then we looked at new norms in COVID. Uh, we then looked at creative praxis. So the next couple after this are on gender in late June, July. And we will have a final seminar where we're sort of finishing off some of these rejuvenate uh, dialogues and relaunching some more. And that will be on uncertainty. And we are all living in uncertainty and doing quite well in it, I think. So uh, we are going to finish at two. And I'm going to move on quite quickly um, to Tessa, who's going to lead us in this dialogue. Um, but do look on the website and do join in with the blogs. Look at li the Living Archive. It's very much an interactive space. Um, thanks to the team, including Mariah and Alice, wonderful Alice, who is also here. Thank you. Tessa, over to you. 
Thanks, Vicky. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited about today. Um, and thanks very much to panelists and the team um, for organising this. And thank you all for coming. Um, so the impetus for this dialogue came out of our first Rejuvenate working paper, which formed the basis of our living archive, um, which you'll find at Rejuvenate Global. And in it, we tried to map the people and the projects and the publications that made up the space at the intersection between child rights and participation. Um, and what we found was that most of the evidence presented um, by what we think of as substantively participatory work, um, the end point of which would be child youth led work, was evidence of the how. In other words, it was slightly circular because it started from an assumption that rights are intrinsically valid, so to speak, and tried to show how to best engage with children or young people, a focus on process rather than on outcomes. Um, for those of you that do participatory work or know the literature, you'll recognize this well. Um, one of the projects we're doing at the moment is we're looking very carefully at what constitutes evidence in the girl child space. In other words, what is it that people measure and what's missing in this? And I think in a global context where we have shrinking civic space and we know that rights agendas are being systematically eroded, um, this conversation becomes even more important. How do we advocate for child or youth rights work while moving beyond advocacy? Um, and we have three panelists today, and I'm really grateful to um, all of them for being a part of this. Uh, Kristen Hope Birchall, the Research Advocacy and Participation Advisor from Ted Ezom. Um, Rhys Slade, an environmental and youth activist from Cape Town, who's involved with Kristen in Ted Ezom's COVID Under-19 initiative. Um, which advocates for the central and meaningful involvement of children in policy and practice in building back better from the pandemic. And Reese's Earth Kids project was set up to educate children and students about pollution and environmental sustainability and collected recycling from businesses and schools in Cape Town, which they used to make early childhood development games for under-resourced preschools. Um, and last, but by no means least, Marina Apgar, who is a participatory monitoring and evaluation specialist, who I happen to share an office with. Um, so we have these conversations quite a bit. Um, and also a fellow at, at the Institute of Development Studies. And she has recently been working on the Clarissa program in which they're grappling with how to be substantively participatory while building a robust evidence base. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to um, a conversation uh, between Kristen and Reese, and, and then um, Marina's gonna pick up the, the conversation and then we're gonna open it um, to all of you for, for Q and A kind of discussion. And we're hoping to leave kind of enough time for that. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, Kristen, Reese, over to you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to start my timer. Because um, <laughs> I don't, I want to leave enough time, obviously, for the discussion, but um, I'm thrilled to be here and really thrilled to be here alongside Reese, um, who is, um, uh, as, as Tessa said, a young activist, um, and who I've been working with, I've had the privilege to work with for almost two years now, and really um, has taught me a lot. And so I'd really, um, um, this this conversation is really about has come out of how we think together and sometimes see things also differently about this question of how do we evidence participatory practice. Um, so I, as this sort of interest introductory remarks, I just like to um, reflect on you know two elements of this or the two sides of the coin. Let's say the sort of challenges that we encounter as practitioners in the child rights space we're trying to do participatory work with children, um, and then to highlight some um, you know what maybe some of the kind of um, the ways out of the impasse as well. Um, you know, in terms of the the challenges, I think we can we there's there's two again two aspects. One is a more of a technical methodological aspect. So um, which which is you know, around questions of indicators and monitoring and evaluation. So you know globally as um, organizations working in the development and humanitarian sector, uh, when we are trying to capture you know change, whether that's at an often at outcome or impact level, um, definitely at at, um, at at output level, we're using quantitative indicators. So globally, our monitoring and evaluation systems are built around quantitative indicators. However, we know that change and changes in the social sphere are very complex. They're often intangible. They're often based on perceptions and feelings, and they're, they're by far from objective. Um, and so basically, we have to, we do 
ask ourselves, and this is why I think this conversation emerged in the first place, you know, are these quantitative global systems to capture change, are they adequate? Uh, what are the challenges with them? What um, also is the threshold of evidence, um, you know, and quantitative element evidence, is there a, uh, a prioritization or hierarchy in evidence that, that hierarchizes um, higher up the, the ladder quantitative? And I think, you know, in in some ways that you know there is and we can see this in the social sciences um but um but this means that in practice meal is often a technical issue um with project teams and field practitioners it can also be quite intimidating because it's it's, it's seen as highly technical um you know the more kind of statistical side of it whereas actually when we uh, work with children and young people and we talk about change um, and, and what matters, we often find that that's, you know, that's not the case, um, that, that real experiences of change don't have to be so technical. But um, so that's one aspect of the challenges. The other aspect of the challenges uh, I, I would like to suggest is that uh, there's a political aspect, for, for lack of a better term, in the sense that it's about how power relationships impact on whose voices are most valued, whose perceptions are, are deemed to be, you know, more viable as evidence, um, and, and what does that say about our assumptions? So, for example, um, in the child rights community, we are still here defending the imperative and the necessity of child right of child participation, despite the fact that it's enshrined in international human rights law in the Convention of the Child under Article 12. Um, and I, I think that this does reveal something around perhaps the, you know, pr the, the, the prejudices or the assumptions of, of adult centrism in, that we in which we operate, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the world. And I, I, I wonder if it would if we compared, for example, to, uh, you know, conversations about, you know, the the necessity for a child participatory practice, if we compare that to, you know, participatory practice it, with respect to other bodies of international human rights law that are also, you know, um, enshrined in conventions. So, um, and if we question, you know, the 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 threshold of evidence um, for those quest for those groups, and I think that it's quite revealing again about our, our our prejudices. So, for example, would we ever say in the human rights space that actually, um, you know, meaningfully integrating or meaningfully enabling the participation of women uh, or uh, of uh, people who people with disabilities, both whose rights are enshrined by respective conventions, CEDAW and the CRPD, would we ever actually say, well, you know, we we up the, the we re, we need to have proof that their participation is um, generating good evidence in order to legitimize that participatory practice. I don't think we would. Um, although, unfortunately, it seems that we are in a context of sh the shrinking space of for human rights. So actually, this raises the bigger question of if we are getting into these conversations where we do need to justify the participation of different groups whose rights are enshrined in international law, are, are we not actually, is this not a dangerous downward spiral into really undermining the very bedrock of the international rights um, uh, discourse? And so just a couple of points to, for us to reflect on the ways out of this impasse. Um, I, I do believe that um, it is uh, critical to continue to advocate for child participation really from a strong rights-based grounding um, and to bring children alongside us. We are guided in this by, for example, you know, the, the nine basic principles on meaningful participation from, our, uh, from General Comment 12 of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and we are able to put these in practice working alongside allies in the field. For example, when COVID under 19, we worked very closely with uh, Professor Laura Lundy at Queen's University Belfast and really using this child rights-based methodology to understand not just what children were experiencing during the pandemic, but also what children's experiences were of their rights. So really the explicit uh, child rights framing, I think is really critical from that power perspective. And then finally, I think that when we come circle back to the technical question, um, I think that we need to reconsider, you know, the, the sufficiency of global quantitative uh, monitoring frameworks. Um, are, are they in themselves sufficient? I, in my opinion, they're not. We need to be in, in intentionally including learning questions that encourage participants to give qualitative 
you know, feedback and to take that feedback seriously. And we also need to be integrating these into feedback loops to the populations that we serve and that we work alongside. So for example, um, at Terre des Hommes, we are having a, a big a discussion internally about, you know, accountability to children and women and men and families and communities. And how do we have the, the conversation about accountability in a way that is understandable, that, 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 that demystifies accountability. So thank you, Mariah, for sharing this. We have tried to create resources that are everyone friendly, that are very visual, and that try to communicate the concepts of accountability um, and the use of evidence um, to a, a wide range of audiences. Because it's only by making these conversations accessible to wider audiences, including children and young people, that we can really break through the impasse. And so this is why I think it's critical to have this voice at the table today, who's represented by Reese, and I'm so keen to, to hear his views and opinions on some of the questions that we've raised just now. So Reese, over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me here. I think it's so important to allow young people and children into these spaces. And I really love a lot of the points that you brought up, Kristen, um, through the, the COVID under 19 journey, which really was a whole process of um, encouraging the culture of child participation. I've learned a lot about, um, about the topic itself and then also just creating different environments and the worth behind child participation. Um, I think a lot of us or most of us can can recognize the the value behind it, but also I think one thing you brought up or what I've noticed in this industry is a lot of the time the language is what creates the barrier between young people participating and academics and other people searching for um, for the the qualitative data. Um, and I think that it really, it doesn't just extend to the, the academic language um, in terms such as qualitative and quantitative, but really just like the Eurocentric um, structure of society today. The mm. fact that a lot of the children that we're trying to connect to um, or majority of the children in the world, their first language isn't English and very much um, these processes and the, the idea of human rights and the idea of appreciating rights and all of these things are set to a specific amount of languages and it excludes a lot of children. Um, and I think one of the biggest ways to actually get through that and to participate with children in the way that you'd like to is to participate with them more. The only way you can sort of work out nuances between different languages and introduce different concepts is really in front of the eyes of a child um, using hand gestures and um, different demonstrations. I think, yeah, so that's becoming a lot more important. And obviously it's a, it's a lot more difficult, especially um, in the current times where travel and things is a lot harder. But I think that also brings up another topic of the internet and how more and more children are just getting access to it. And with that really comes the value um, behind on like the, I guess you could say the corporate level or whatever, the funder level in terms of getting behind child participation with the growing trend of young people going online and are who are aware of their rights and are searching and are looking for different organizations, but also have the resources to look behind their different philanthropical um, schemes and humanitarian things. They're able to see the details behind it and then realize what's actually working for their community, um, what's greenwashing, which we like to say a lot, um, which is basically saying, your company is doing something, whereas it's really just the surface level. You say um, all of our clothes are green. Meanwhile, it, it doesn't mean environmentally friendly. It means that the clothes are literally colored green. Um, so behind that, there's a big trend for children now looking at that and getting more grounds um, by using the internet as a research to give accountability to different 
projects and things. And through that really comes another aspect promoting the, the use of child participation or the increase of that habit um, because it really just ensures efficient and effective work. Uh, you can't just, um, for example, with my organization, what I've been through, what I've realized making um, early childhood development games out of plastic and recycling, I was about 15. I, even though I was a child, I don't remember being as young as the, the children I was working with in preschools. But with that, we were working a lot with occupational therapists and preschool teachers and parents to try and work out the best games possible. And then we'd present them to the children and we'd see that the games were too flimsy and they were breaking them at first glance or they just looked incredibly boring with no colors and it was no, no desire for a child to get to interact with it. And even though I, I imagine because I had that aspect um, and so many professionals working with me, I kind of wasn't really encouraged to seek out the, the child's thought until I actually arrived there. And just from that, um, also, that really speaks about the idea of qualitative data because seeing a, ch a child and um, seeing how they break a, like a yoga tub that's made into building stacks for early childhood development and fine motor skills, you can't really capture that data on a, like a, I can't even explain how you would try and record that. Um, but it's incredibly useful to know that, you know what, you need to make these games stronger in order for the, the actual effect that we are looking for. Yeah, so I think it's a huge, a huge topic and I'm really grateful for a platform like this where children can be encouraged to speak up, yeah. Well, as always, Reese, as I said at the beginning, when I listen to you, I'm, I'm always learning. And so when I, it's, I, I think it's so revealing as well, because when we talk about, uh, when, when I say we, I mean some adults in the field of monitoring and evaluation in development or humanitarian context in, and in child rights, we talk about accountability as, you know, methodologies and indicators, and we have our kind of like space, you know, quite strict, you know, tropes uh, for understanding these terms. And then, you know, you as an 18 year old who's been doing, you know, uh, you know, who's been a social entrepreneur, um, who's an, uh, who's an environmental activist, uh, and also who's been involved in the child rights work as a child and now as a young person, you immediately raise our, uh, you know, you, you point out our blind spots, right? You know, you're taught, you, you highlight the importance of social media as a, as a, as a, as a place in which accountability happens, you know, in which children hold, you know, uh, come companies or you know charities to account through you know sort of like you know collective action and I think that's why you know I think what we're demonstrating here is the importance of having you and voices like you always included um, because it shows our blind spots um I have just a couple of questions for you because um uh, I you know as someone who has um, you know, both led, you know, uh, social enterprise as a child, but also who's been involved in these different uh, child rights initiatives at global level with COVID under 19, you're also involved in Child Rights Connect, you've addressed the Human Rights Council at the United Nations, um, you know, in your opinion, what does good monitoring look like, you know, as COVID under 19, we have a questionnaire that tries to capture, you know, what are the outcomes at the level of your psychosocial well being, and you filled that and others have filled that we can, we can get some data, we can say ah, X percent of the participants felt that they, you know, their participation led them to make more meaningful change in their lives. But is that good enough? What should we be doing? differently um and then just my last real question about you know efficiency and a rights-based approach you know what happens you know participatory action in many ways is not actually efficient it's actually quite resource and labor intensive and how do we kind of balance those two things um it would i'd love to hear your views about that amazing of course um obviously i'm not an academic but i can definitely give the opinion of a, an 18 year old who is on social media um but in terms of monitoring what I've realized is since young, I've been very encouraged to speak up and give my truthful opinions in the space of child rights and whenever child participation is encouraged and even in spaces outside of that. And I think that really comes from um, just from young, 
I've been involved with nonprofits and different organizations who are very um, child rights focused and very much freedom of speech focused. And through that, it just kind of sparked a, a culture within myself. I got comfortable in those spaces to speak out. And then from there, I was in my principal's office every second week to complain about something. Um, so I think it's one thing we should definitely try and create questionnaires and all of those sort of things to kind of create the culture, but it's something that will naturally happen in my opinion. If we keep asking children about their opinions and we keep asking them about how they feel about something, at the end of the day, children will just say it and it will just come up naturally. And the one thing that children, children who are young learn the most from children who are a bit older. So if they can see kids who are speaking about these things openly, it's just gonna be a whole snowball effect that carries on forever. Um, and in fact, in the other question, I think that's a very, it's a very big question as well because it's something I've been trying to figure out as well. Um, I think from my perspective, trying to fulfill my work, but then also realize um, or try and record different data and things at the same time in order to either improve my work or actually scope the, the situation of communities I'd like to help. Um, and I think it's something, it really needs a team and it needs experienced people and as the world works today, it needs money. Um, so it needs all that kind of support behind it. And I think if we can do it efficiently, we'll realize how effective it is and beneficial um, to the whole uh, human rights sector and the whole social sector. Um, it's no longer going to be doing things for, for good, but rather doing good things that are good and actually have like a, an overall benefit for all of society because if we can uplift communities and children in beneficial ways they're going to be creating entrepreneurs and people who can speak up and have their own culture and um, confidence to participate in different spaces and from that there's going to be more people challenging each other in respective industries and from that just a whole growth of entrepreneurship or innovation. I, yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you, Reese. I love sharing this platform with you. And um, yeah, really look, we, I think I speak on behalf of both of us where I say we look forward to any reactions or questions from the audience. And with that, I pass back to Tessa. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, Marina, I'm gonna go straight to you and then ask for questions afterwards. Brilliant. Thanks, Tessa. Um, thanks so much, um, Kristen and, and Reese. Really, really inspiring. There's so much to, to react to. So I'm going to try, try and keep this um, short. Um, I, I wanted to, to start by going back to Tessa, something you said at the outset, which was this question around uh, what we evaluate and whether it's process or outcomes. And indeed, does it need to be kind of both? Um, and that's, that's a lot of, of, of what I do in my research and, and share that agenda with many colleagues who are working on participatory interventions and, and methodologies. The question is, how do we build, and I'm going to throw the, the term robust into this, robust evidence, right? So evidence is a term that's like loosely used and overused, right? And we often don't define what we mean by it, right? Rigor is this sort of dirty word <laughs> that's often used. But, um, but robust in terms of it's, con it's convincing, right? It covers enough bases. Um, and, and back to this question of, is it about just how these processes work? Um, no, it's also about what they achieve and for whom and how they achieve different kinds of outcomes in different contexts, right? And so there's wider societal outcomes that we believe come through building uh, spaces for children and youth to participate. So understanding that broader impact. And so there's a long history of doing participatory development and working on child participation and rights. Uh, and we know it works, right? We're convinced through our practice, but 
I think we do also have back to this idea of blind spots, right? Uh, we often ignore our own bias in the way we go about making sense of these processes. We, as, as Tessa was saying, it can be fairly circular the way we approach it. And we're often in a mood of, of proving rather than understanding, right? And that I think links a lot also to the kind of advocacy agenda and often an advocacy approach to evidence, right? To prove that something works. And Chris and I agree entirely with the point you made about talking about what evidence matters is not simply a technical exercise, but it's a political um, process. Uh, so I agree entirely with that. And I guess what I would add is that I think often evaluation is seen as this sort of overly technical, scary, um, and instrumental sort of process. Um, and I guess my uh, sort of invitation is that we could think about how we bring the technical and the political together, right, in building a robust evidence base that's going to speak to multiple audiences, right? Um, and so I often think about evaluation as using the technical indeed even kind of subverting, if you like, the technical in order to achieve the political, right? And just listening to, to um, what you were saying, Kristen, I'm also thinking about whether this is about bringing together the rights-based and the evidence-based, right? I don't know if anybody's written about that, but if they haven't, we should, because, because I think it's actually at the intersection and these things are often kind of in opposition and I think that's unhelpful. So. I think evaluation research, um, which is a hybrid form of you evaluate interventions, but you're doing so through bringing a critical and political stance, right? The kind of research stance into the process of evaluation can really help us do this. It's a space that um, is hybrid, as I said, and I think NGOs are thinking about how to build more of it, but it is true that a lot of NGO evaluation remains fairly indicator-based, quite sort of um, standard sort of project um, and, 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 and tight kind of project m and &E. But I think, there's, I think there's an opening. And it's interesting for me often to be in these conversations, um, putting sort of my evaluator hat on and listening to people talk about evaluation as if it were stuck in the world of RCTs, right? Um, I, I'm Sorry, from RCT. Oh, uh, randomized control trials. So Thanks. experimental designs, counterfactual logics, yeah. Um, I'm far more positive, right? Appreciating that I'm in probably an eclectic bubble, right? So it's not the whole world of evaluation, but certainly there are more and more conversations uh, and more and more growth in methodological innovation that can help us do the kinds of things that you were both describing. Um, so putting storytelling at the center of how we make sense of, of these kinds of processes. Most, uh, most participatory evaluation methodologies and ones that I would, uh, I would use are based on storytelling in some shape or form, right? So it, um, yeah, so the point is there are, there are ways of doing this. Um, there is a lot more opening in the evaluation space and really important, I see donors asking for more what's now increasingly being called meaningful measurement or meaningful evaluation, yeah? That's increasingly something that donors are asking for. It's really interesting if you go to evaluation conferences of which there's a series of them in the next couple of months, if <laughs> any of you will be there, um, there's often conversations between the donors on one side and evaluators on the, on the other side, and the donors moaning that the evaluators won't give them, they won't, they won't bring the methodological innovation that's required and the evaluators complaining that the donors never give them the space to do it, right? And the truth is somewhere in between the two, but the point is that there is that exchange and conversation happening. So one example I can um, briefly describe is in the Clarissa program that was mentioned, which is the Child Labor Action Research and Innovation in South and Southeast Asia um, FCDO funded program, working on worst forms of child labor in Bangladesh and, and Nepal. Um, where we start with participatory methods, and this is a child-centered program. Um, so embedded in the action research processes, which are child-centered with children, but also other stakeholders, employers, et cetera, other, others involved in the broader child labor um, system. Um, they're involved directly in defining and measuring what matters, right? And what works, yeah? So that's a kind of 
deeply embedded in the participatory action research process using storytelling. Um, uh, and and, and Reese, to your point, I think through that building the capacity to reflect and, and, and the agency to be part of making sense of, of, of how things happen and what works. But then we add to that other methods such as outcome harvesting, process tracing, in order to help us to then test theories that have been generated through formal evidence by us, by the program, by the adults, right? Um, using realist evaluation contribution analysis. And so the idea of this bricolage is that you can be deeply participatory in making sense of what's happening, but you can also then speak to broader forms of evidence that can be helpful in being convincing, right? This idea of the robust evidence base. Now, I don't think it's one or the other. It's in fact both. And within that, um, if quantitative data is useful, you collect quantitative data, yeah? Um, so in all theory-based evaluation, you're not driven by the method, but you're driven by the questions of the different stakeholders. Critical would be that the, that the children and youth are part of deciding what the right question is to ask, right? Then I think you're getting some more radical participation in the evaluation space. It's not just in the data you collect from them, it's how they're actually involved in setting the agenda, yeah? So how do we make measurement of child participation more meaningful? Um, so based on what I've just shared and in my experience, I think it's, first of all, it's about moving away from being dogmatic about using one method. And evaluation is a field which can be quite dogmatic, as is a lot of social science <laughs> research, right? We tend to come at things with our little box of tools and we like to use those. So, um, so finding the right mix of methods um, and and, and this would include also being overly dogmatic about participatory methods. So you can do a deeply participatory process, um, but you may not actually be able to answer causal inference questions. You may not actually be convincing to policymakers, right? So how do you combine that with other methods? That's, that's the point. You can do an experimental design and you can have some brilliant uh, data on what worked, but you have no understanding of how or why, and you don't have the lived experience. And clearly it's highly problematic to not include um, uh, lived experience in the way Brees described it was perfect in terms of you know, the, the, the different ways in which you need to make sense. Um, the second point is that it's, we often talk about this tension between accountability and learning. So I love to see TDH's view of accountability as multiple forms, et cetera. It's not, again, it's not this dichotomy, right? It's often in bringing the two together. Having an accountability push can be really helpful to push us to think a bit more about what is being achieved, right? We're very comfortable in the how things work and the process space. So adding the what question can actually be quite a useful thing to think about doing. Um, and then finally, I think, I think where the challenge still lies is for me, it's about uh, plurality. It's, it's actually around engaging with the different types of questions and different needs of different stakeholders that you're going to get the best evidence that is going to be most useful and most convincing in order to create the change we're, we're seeking. That's not easy to do. And there are times when you have to silence certain voices in order to hear others, yeah? So it's not that everybody sits at the table and you have this wonderful negotiation around uh, wh whose question matters most. Uh, and that's very, that's the kind of political dance, I think. Um, so appreciating that evaluation can help with the technical, but it needs to do so in a way that can be part of that political dance. I think I'll stop there, Tessa. Hopefully that wasn't... Thanks, that's great, Marina, ending on, on power and political dance and plurality. Um, I'm going to withhold my um, comments as chair for now and um, ask if anyone has any direct questions of any of the panellists or any points of clarity or any comments. And I don't know how you want to do this, whether you want to just jump up and down, raise your hand, um, put um, something in the chat. There's a couple in the chat, so I think no, now. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. So uh, in the chat, I don't know if you want to ask that now. Now. Hi. 
Hi, yes, I, I am Northern Dao. You can call me No. It's easy to call. So I'm from Myanmar. Uh, you all, I, I think you all know Myanmar because this is very quite popular recently. So <clears throat> my question is in the chat box as well. And I just would like to highlight about the situations of the children in our country, like mostly uh, are under the oppressions of the 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 military government and uh, there are lots of lots of issue uh, in our country and especially like there are uh, like lots lots of post recruitment or something like that those those of the issues is happening so uh, for me i'm currently working the child protection project especially in the conflict affected area so uh, when i'm conducting the monitoring or evaluation uh, section with the children so i just would like to get their opinion uh, about this project or about their life or like uh, what, what they would like to improve, something like that. I just would like to know their opinion and their feelings, but it, it is quite difficult to get their opinion because as I mentioned in my chat box, so most of us are neglected since, since childhood for our participation in the discussion. So when I ask something, so they, they don't have like, I think they they dare not to speak out, or maybe they they even don't know how to think out their opinion or something like that. So I just would like mm -hmm. to know what will be the best uh, like um, evidence based tools to use uh, while like you know uh, uh, interviewing those kinds of children. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. I think um, Reese actually said something which resonated and speaks directly to that about encouraging the culture of child participation. Um, and it, it, I guess implied in that was was both the kind of um, longitudinal or the time it takes to develop trust, but also to build that kind of culture. Um, and in terms of specific methods, I mean, yes, other people here are probably better placed to talk to that than me. but. Um, Reese, do you want to expand on on what you what you said in relation to that, or any other panelists? Sure, um, I could say something. Um, I think the situation, as in in many different countries, is completely different, and I have no right to to give any concrete thoughts on that. But what I can I can say is that after being a child, I realized that in different situations, different things are important to you. And that often almost blinds you from the view of the entire picture. So if you need, if you're approached by people collect, collecting data or seeking your participation, but they seem to be asking about, about questions or things that you haven't really experienced in your life or you don't find as necessary, um, even though from an academic perspective, it's in relation to events that are very connected to the child situation. I think through that, one should also really encourage the education um, behind the, the reasoning for collecting this sort of information and uh, seeking child participation and provide that evidence to children. Um, and including them in the process, just so that there's a transparency and that would also connect to encouraging the culture of speaking out. Thanks, Ruth. Um, Kristen, you wanted to come in? Thank you. Yeah, and just maybe to, to build on that and also um, I think what your question now raises such an important point. Um, and I think Reese mentioned this as well when he was speaking about the, de you know, the decolonization of, um, of, of, of the, you know, of, of aid, of, you know, of the, the importance to, to have a kind of nuanced understanding of, of, of the of human rights discourse as something which has been and can be colonial and, you know, how do we, um, you know, react to that. And I think that, you know, so part you, by, by you bringing this question to this forum, you're also, you know, um, asking of us, you know, to also um, to, to, to localize and to ground, you know, some of these ideas in a specific context, which is a context characterized by, um, by a, a, a coup d'etat that happened last year and by, you know, um, severe repression uh, of, um, 
of of, uh, of, of civilians in different uh, terms, and 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 so I think that this 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 question raises some real uh, you know real pressing uh, issues that that practitioners need to grapple with, um, and 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 the responses. Uh, you know, need to be context specific. Um, but um, so some of the things immediately come to mind when you're speaking are questions of say, which we haven't been able to, to cover in this conversation, but questions around the ethics of data collection um, and with respect to say, do no harm, you know, how, and th the question of do no harm, whether that's in, in research in general, but also, you know, around, you know, asking any questions that are used for, you know, monitoring purposes, I think is, is very important in a context where we know that, you know, raising your voice can, um, can have um, severely, you know, negative consequences. Um, and so, uh, and again, linked to that, and it kind of touches on what Reese has been saying around the culture of participation. Um, you know, there are many contexts in the world that where there are, there is not an enabling environment for participation by adults or children um, due to the political characteristics of the, the, the context. And so what do we, do we as a community of child rights people do with that complexity um, and um, and and I think this is also where um, you know the advocacy element comes in as well um, and and how we position ourselves on um, you know in, in with respect to human rights and child rights advocacy as well as you know the actual operational aspects of what we do say you, you said you spoke in child protection um, and so I think that that's something to to, to dive into the last thing I also would just say is, um, uh, um, you know, I, you know, your point of, of, of seeking, you know, opinions of children and that it's difficult um, uh, and, 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 and questioning also the, the tools that are available. I think that, and I think I've just seen Marina in the chat mentioning something. Um, again, I think that, 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 that there can be some tools. I'm sure there are some useful, uh, there's some useful learning as well from other contexts and maybe even some, some evidence from Myanmar. But I think that the, the other question that I would invite you to ask and to reflect upon with colleagues, your organization is, you know, why do we need this data? How are we going to use it? How do the, the people that we serve uh, understand the use of this information? And what do they do, what do they think about that? And do they think these are the types of questions that they would be asking if, if you know, about what matters for them in our intervention? And so this is where this, this is why for me, the, the question of accountability is so centrally located here, because it's about, again, what matters for who? Um, and, and, and who owns change, you know? And um, I mean, that's a big question, but I, I ask more questions here because I think it's really important for, for these to be, you know, uh, really worked on in specific contexts because that's how we can, you know, move through the MPAS. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for your reply. Thanks very much, Snow. Any other responses, questions? Silence. I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or not. Well, it's just the... Uh, that time of day. Raisa? Hey. Yeah, I, I don't have a response to that question, but I, I want to ask a different one. I just want to say, hi, I'm Raisa. Um, I've been working on child rights for a bit now, but um, I just want to say, I'm so sorry, I came in a little late, so I don't know whether this is something we've already discussed. And if it is, then please ask me to keep quiet. Uh, so I... I was just thinking about what everyone was saying and how it's important to, uh, you know, really try and find methods and tools so that everyone can be a part of the conversation. I'm just coming off a weekend where um, I was the terrible m &E kind of person who's trying to work with a group of grassroots activists and youth activists who are all doing such amazing, important work. They know why they're doing the work. And I am trying to make them all put that on paper and put it on a whiteboard in front of them. And I realized that one of the factors, and I think there's a lovely blog piece about this on the Rejuvenate blog as well. One of the major factors here is time, where it requires a lot of time for this communication to happen. And in this larger structure in which this whole development uh, narratives are built, it's definitely comes off the larger neoliberal e economic uh, space where you're thinking of productivity, efficiency, etc. as factors and time is something that we just don't seem to have. It's always limited. It's always uh, constrained. 
So, and I think that's specifically where what Marina was speaking about in terms of the political comes in. So I just really would like to know what all of you have been working on this for quite some time. Think about this and, you know, any responses to it would really uh, make me feel better about my weekend. <laughs> Thanks, Raisa. Marina. Thanks so much, Raisa. Just uh, for starters to say, I empathize. <laughs> um, I guess I would say two things. The, the, the time piece is huge, no? Uh, absolutely. And it's not a new kind of conversation in the, in the participation space, but as as uh, space shrinks, as um, our processes of funding become more and more neoliberal, et cetera, time becomes a, uh, a bigger challenge for us all. So the way I like to think about it is um, that maybe sometimes we need to also not construct processes uh, around, our <laughs> around our funding and our projects and our interventions, no? So, uh, what does it look like to think about uh, the process that you're nurturing with a group of activists around their learning, their questions, right, that maybe sit slightly outside of what the m &E requirements are? And you feed the m &E requirements through it, right, but you don't drive it from the very specific m &E requirements. So thinking about it as a deeper, broader process, um, which sometimes it's hard to do if you're not in the context and you're not embedded and this is where i think partnerships matter right it's not me that's likely to be embedded in processes with youth movements in order to be able to uh, build sense making and learning processes that feed m e versus just collecting m e data right but somebody else is closer. <laughs> Somebody is closer to the ground. And I don't know your specific situation. Maybe you are closer to the ground. But nurturing those relationships, and as Reese was saying, to build the culture and the capacity, right, um, is, is maybe a slightly different way of, of, of thinking about m and &E. I always encourage m and &E people to not just think about the boxes and the log frame, but to think about the broader process that they're trying to, they're trying to support. Thanks, Rena. It's really helpful. Raisa, do you want to come back? I feel like you do. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And I think in this specific context, um, these are a group of people who actually cannot access whatever is funding or whatever exists because of the kind of work they do. And they've literally brought me in because I can understand what they're talking about and I can understand what this other group of people are talking about. And they want me to put their work into these boxes so that they can access some amount of funding because money is also at some point becomes a requirement. Otherwise, everyone's living on subsistence every day for the last 20 years. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I know this is now a circular conversation, so I'm not expecting a response. I'm just saying that uh, sometimes time is the only way out. And I really hope that there are like genuine political movements that question the larger structure within which we're trying to make these negotiations yeah. and I, I don't know who's going to start that and how we're going to work towards it but it's, it's a great, it out there. great example of of using kind of the evaluation lens to subvert right and being the broker yeah. but I know others <laughs> want to speak yeah Vicky yeah I was just going to say I can really relate to where you're coming from and time resources but it, it's also about this issue of educating the funders and the adults and a wonderful uh, research I was working with in the Caribbean said it's like a buffet approach you know people have to try it and see and it's only when they see that there are really positive benefits of these children and young people being involved and I think this is where the communication and the spaces for adults to actually learn and see and be involved will never do it without changing adult perspectives and I think communication is important what are they missing what will happen if they don't listen to children and young people look at the state we're in so I think it's seeing is believing and actually bringing adults along with us and we need communications people and that's I guess what we're trying to start in Rejuvenate is to communicate between different 
people and to provide a space to do that. And we hope to do that more. But I, I totally understand that. Um, any other responses, questions? I think I can see most people on my screen. Um, Kristen, hey. Um, maybe just to also react to what Raisa was saying, and I think that it's, um, and, and building on what Marina mentioned, you know, thinking about allyship or partner partnership, but I will use the word allyship, you know, um, and I, I love uh, Marina when you had uh, highlighted the importance of storytelling, you know, I think that, you know, people who are activists, you know, also uh, value having their stories told, but also it might be in different mediums. And then, so who are the allies in the space who can contribute to, you know, facilitate storytelling in different ways? You know, yes, it could be written down in a box or it could be, you know, in a vlog or it could be, you know, in a conversation like this. And I think that like the more kind of agile, what I take also from what Marina was saying is yes, we need plurality. We also kind of, and I know agile is kind of overused and over romanticized, but like, you know, where is our kind of like agility and also creativity, you know, to be able to see opportunities for where we can capture learning um, for where we can you know um, generate discussions and, um, um, and and again where are the allies who can who can help us to do that in a way that's most um, that that's that's you know that's that 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 helps to, to reduce the burden of the time that it might take to sort of do it in a certain you know way but that that is um, that is I want to use the right word that is robust <laughs> um, and um, uh, yes, and I think, but and but I think that again, we should. I I, I really think that from a uh, from a rights perspective, I do think that our um, in my view, our perspective and that the message should be, you know, we should be you know doing this work um, uh, again, regardless of the 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 way in which the evidence is considered to be good or not or, or you know you know robust or rigorous enough. You know, we should be doing it because it is international human rights law that we seek to uphold as part of an, an infrastructure of how we exist on this planet, you know, as, as different groups. And so um, I do think it's important to, that, that we're not, you know, um, that, that, that um, you know, that it's a both and, you know, the rights are, you know, the right to participate is a, a right in itself. And it's also a means to achieve other rights, right? So it's also contributes, it's both and. Um, and I, I think that we always have to do that. Otherwise we, we risk kind of like in the instrumentalizing um, uh, uh, narrative, which I think is really harmful again to, to the whole body of rights. And it, 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 it's the downward spiral of the shrinking space. Thanks Kristen for like expressing so much complexity so speedily. I just wanted to come in on the ally thing because it's like a red flag for me because I was very heavily involved in the roads must fall, fees must fall um, kind of protest and studying that at a time where the notion of allyship was being heavily contested um, partly because of its somehow, and I know you didn't mean it in a problematic way at all, but, but um, some, something about the, the lack of recognition of complicated power dynamics is sometimes erased by an assumed allyship. And in the context of that, um, I am a massive fan of Tina Camp's work. Um, um, for those of you that don't know, she writes on kind of visual culture and, and politics and race. And she, in response to the kind of conversation about allyship, has this notion of adjacency, which speaks directly to some of the things we were talking about with regards to accountability and also with regards to time and work that it takes to kind of do these kind of processes. She says, adjacency is the reparative work of transforming proximity into accountability, the labor of positioning oneself in relation to another in ways that revalue and redress the complex histories of dispossession. And I think, um, yeah, I just, I really love that in terms of kind of contesting the notion of allyship. And it's, um, we're out of time and I promised this time to end on time, which I failed to do last time. Um, thank you so much all for coming. Aris had to drop off early because he has a day job. And so he was doing this kind of undercover, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Vicky, Mariah, um, Raisa, all of you. And please um, engage with our archive. Please write interesting blogs for us. Um, and yeah, thank you very much everyone for being here and see you again soon, I hope.